Sergeant Hollister had taken cover behind the patrol car, but Harper and Fuller, who had started toward the house, were now directly under the street light. A booming voice came from somewhere overhead. Drop the guns or I'll kill you both, it said. It was the assailant from inside the house. He had gone upstairs and stepped out onto the porch with his shotgun. He was looking down onto the two officers. Harper quickly darted around to the side of the house, but Fuller, the less experienced officer, dropped his gun and raised his hands. The assailant yelled down to the cop with the raised hands, Tell your buddy to come out too, or I'm going to kill you. As if on cue, Harper darted back long enough to take a shot at the man with the shotgun. The man hurried back into the house. Fuller scooped up his revolver and ran for cover. Dispatch called Sergeant Hollister with additional information on the assailant, one Fred Draper, 47, and the father of three. He'd been despondent over losing his job and had been drinking for most of the day. By the time the police arrived at the scene, he'd had more than his share of alcohol. Couple that with a shotgun, and you've got a cop's worst nightmare. He straightened out again. I heard a dull cracking sound and looked at Sandy. She was holding her side, blood oozing out between her fingers. She fell to the floor, trying to hold on to the edge of our table as she went down. I looked at the window next to our booth. There was a fresh bullet hole right about where Elliot's head had been seconds earlier. It had been Sandy's bad luck to lean over just at that time, forcing him to lean back out of the path of the bullet. Elliot and I quickly slid out of the booth and hit the floor. Elliot always wore his thirty eight under his arm, on duty or off, and he had it now. I hadn't worn my gun for several weeks, and had no reason to wear it tonight. Another dull crack rang out, and a second hole appeared in the window. Elliot crawled to the front door and stood up alongside it, trying to cautiously peek out into the night. He saw a black sedan squealing away down the street, fishtailing. Elliot reached into the back seat and opened the camera case pulling the film camera onto his lap. He familiarized himself with where to hold it and where the controls were. If he was going to play the part, he might as well try to be convincing. The rumbling increased until it became deafening. Suddenly, 40 or 50 motorcycles caught up with my car. Some stayed behind us, while others passed us, and still others rode alongside our car. We were surrounded by the Hell's Angels. The long-haired, greasy, tattooed animals who rode the bikes yelled and waved their middle fingers and swung heavy chains over their heads. On the backs of several of the bikes were women. Well, technically they were women. In their black leathers and colorful bandanas, they looked as tough as some of the guys. And what came out of their mouths was nobody's idea of Sunday school recitation. Again, Dad chimed in with, God bless you. I glanced over at my weekend fishing partner with a quizzical look on my face. I have to ask you, I said, why do you feel compelled to say God bless you every time I sneeze? Huh? Dad said. What's with the blessing every time I sneeze? I said. You did it back in the boat and again just now. What's up with that anyway? Habit, I guess, Dad said. Why? Habit, I said. That's it? Habit? It was nearly four o'clock, and Elliot hadn't heard a word from Gloria or Matt since Matt had called him from Coldwater Canyon. He let his dad know that he and Gloria were following the two suspects on foot now. That was nearly an hour ago, and Elliot was beginning to get worried. He paced back and forth within the office, occasionally stopping to stare out the window down onto Hollywood Boulevard. After another ten minutes of pacing, Elliot turned on the desktop radio that sat in the corner on top of the tiny refrigerator. He twisted the channel knob and stopped when he heard a newscaster's voice. And we have more on that shooting in Coldwater Canyon that left at least one person dead and another person in critical condition during our 5 o'clock report. The radio switched to a DJ who started to announce the next song when Elliot switched off the radio. Elliot thought he could feel his heart stop for a moment, and he stood there, unable or unwilling to digest the information he'd just gotten from the radio.